Okay, in Judges 11, which we're going to talk about today, this is a chapter that is dedicated to uh, some more women, actually, in the Old Testament. We're going to learn some interesting things here. So uh, Jephthah is chosen as the captain of the armies of Israel. Uh, so this is, again, you remember in the last chapter, the uh, people of Ammon were gathered over in Gilead on the east side of Jordan uh, with some of the other groups, and they were gathering together to fight against Israel, they had already occupied the east side. They had battled on the west side a little bit. And now Israel's coming over to the east side to fight them. So Jephthah is chosen as the captain of the armies of Israel. The Ammonites assail Israel in war. Jephthah is guided by the spirit and defeats Ammon with a great slaughter. He makes a rash vow, which leads to the sacrifice of his only daughter. So a good moral of the story. Be careful what you promise with God, because you got to keep it. If he keeps his promise, he expects you to keep yours. And I have... Uh, Made some of those hasty promises myself, um, but it uh, worked out. But yeah, some, you know, be careful. As God will keep his end of the promise. All right, verse one. Now Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty man of valor, and he was the son of an harlot, and Gilead begat Jephthah. So he was a Gileadite, basically. And uh, remember, we've been talking about all of these things. So he's kind of a descendant there. Gilead's wife bear him sons and his wife's sons grew up and they thrust out Jephthah and said unto him thou shalt not inherit in our father's house for thou art the son of a strange woman and then Jephthah fled from his brethren and dwelt in the land of Tob and there were gathered vain men to Jephthah and went out with him it came to pass in the process of time that the children of Ammon made war against Israel so there remember they had the Abimelech's dead they had about 45 years of Judges, these two judges helping him out, and now they're running out. of Those are gone. Israel's now in bondage again. Now they're looking for somebody else to help out. So Jephthah is going to be this person. So it was when the children of Ammon made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to fetch Jephthah out of the land of Tob. And they said unto Jephthah, Come and be our captain, that we may fight with the children of Ammon. And Jephthah said unto the elders of, Is of Gilead, Did not ye hate me and expel me out of my father's house? Why are you coming to me now when ye are in distress? So again, because he wasn't of the right lineage, he was seen as not valuable. And so they kicked him out of society, basically. They got rid of him, wouldn't let him leave. They said, you're out of here. There. You're never getting inheritance. You're gone because you don't fit our mold. Now they're at a point where they need a strong soldier to lead them. And they realize this Jephthah guy has got it. He's got those resources. He's, he's our man. He can help us out. So now they're going back to him going, oh, we're sorry. We're sorry. He's like, why? You guys hated me for all these years. And now you want me to be the, the, the ruler here, basically. Uh, and then verse 8, and the elders of Gilead said unto Jephthah, uh, therefore we turn again to thee now that thou mayest go with us and fight against the children of Ammon and be our head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. You know, how common is this? where people only value because of the value it brings to them. This happens a lot when you get into public office, uh, even in some entrepreneurship or other organizations, you're only seen as, your only value is seen as the value you contribute to the organization and not the intrinsic value that you actually have. So this happens and then, oh, we got too many, we gotta kick all these people out, you're, you're no longer needed, you know, nothing personal. Uh, but that's, this happens all the time because they're thinking of themselves. What is value? How are you valuable to me? As long as you're valuable to me, I like it. If you're not valuable to me, I'll push you away and then I'll bring you back and uh, tell you something sweet and nice to convince you that it's okay so that your mercy will overcome my judgment and uh, you'll, you'll help me in what I want to get accomplished. Basically, it's what commonly happens. You see it all the time in organizations. Verse 9, and Jephthah said unto the elders of, Israel, of Gilead, excuse me, if ye bring me home again to fight against the children of Ammon, and the Lord deliver them before me, shall I be your head? So he's putting a good point here. He says, look, if you bring me in, you've banished me from Israel. If you let me come back, you now ask me to come back, basically. If I come back and we win, do I get to rule Israel, or are you going to kick me out again? And I think that's a fair question to be asked. Verse 10, the elders of Gilead said unto Jephthah, the Lord be witness between us if we do not sow according to thy words. So they said, as God is our witness, if you defeat Ammon, you will be the king, basically. You'll be the ruler. So there's the benefit 
to Jephthah for full fullness. He's not just being pulled out, going to do all this great work, do all the sacrifice, and then get kicked to the curb. There is a reward for him in this. So, and again, this is still that shallow, personal, selfish thinking that people have. What's, what is it for me? Verse 11, Then Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and all the people made him head and captain over them. And Jephthah uttered all his words before the Lord in Mizpah. So he's trying to get, you know, praying to God to learn and, and, and have God help him. Verse 12, Then Jephthah sent messengers unto the king of the children of Ammon, saying, What hast thou to do with me, that thou art come against me to fight in my land? So he's like, Why are you attacking us? Why are you doing this to us? Why are you oppressing us? And the king of the children of Ammon answered unto the messengers of Jephthah, Because Israel took away my land when they came out of Egypt, from Arnon even unto Jabbok, unto Jordan, and now therefore restore those lands again peaceably. So Ammon's going, Hey, your ancestors kicked us out of our land. We were there first. It was our land. So we want you to give it back. And if you give it back to us, there's no problems, no battles, if you just give it over to us. Uh, of course, Israel knows that it wasn't given to them just willy-nilly. God said, here's what needs to happen, basically. And unfortunately, the children of Israel didn't fully get rid of the Ammonites. Uh, okay, so then verse 14, Jephthah sent messengers again, again unto the king of the children of Ammon and said unto him, Thus saith Jephthah, Israel took not away the land of Moab, nor the children of Ammon. But when Israel came up from Egypt and walked through the wilderness unto the Red Sea and came to Kadesh, then Israel sent messengers unto the king of Edom, saying, Let me, I pray thee, pass through thy land. But the king of Edom would not hearken thereto. And in like manner they sent unto the king of Moab, but he would not consent. And Israel abode in Kadesh. Now you remember this story when they did this? So let's get verse 18. Then they went along through the wilderness and compassed the land of Edom and the land of Moab and came by the east side of the land of Moab and pitched on the other side of Arnon, but came not within the border of Moab, for Arnon was the border of Moab. And Israel sent messengers unto Sion, king of the Amorites, the king of Heshbon. And Israel said unto him, Let us pass, we pray thee, through thy land into my place. But Sion trusted not Israel to pass through his coast. But Sion gathered all his people together and pitched in Jahaz and fought against Israel. So this is, uh, oh, verse 21. Let me finish this out real quick. Then we'll, we'll discuss it. And the Lord God of Israel delivered Sion and all his people into the hand of Israel, and they smote them. So Israel possessed all the lands of the Amorites, the inhabitants of that country. And they possessed all the coasts of the Amorites from Arnon even unto Jabbok and from the wilderness even unto Jordan. So now the Lord God of Israel hath dispossessed the Amorites from his, before his people Israel, and shouldst thou possess it? So just, I'm going to pause right there for a little bit, because there's a little bit more he says. So if you remember, okay, let's go back and remember this. Uh, this isn't the promised land, okay? This isn't the promised land. I think I mentioned that right a little bit earlier. This isn't the promised land. God didn't give this land to them. It was after the fact that they got it. But if you remember, they were asked, they asked the king, you let us pass peacefully through your land. And the king said, no, you're not passing peacefully through my land. I'm going to come out and kill you. And Israel had to defend themselves and they won and wiped the other nation out. So they got the land, basically. That's how they got it and did that. And so he's, so Jephthah is reminding him, wait a minute, my ancestor didn't take your land. Your people tried to kill my ancestors. <clears throat> and so we wiped them out. Then we'd possess the land after that, basically. So verse 24, will not thou possess that which Chemosh thy God giveth thee to possess? So whomsoever the Lord our God shall drive out from before us, them will we possess. So, and he says the same thing here. And now art thou anything better than Balak, the son of Zippor, the king of Moab? Did he ever strive against Israel or did he ever fight against them? When Israel dwelt in Heshbon and her towns, and in Aroer and her towns and all the cities that be along the coast of Arnon 300 years, why therefore did ye not recover them within that time? So he's bringing up this other point too, not just, hey, your people attacked us first. We defended and then won the battle. So we took the land, but we've been here for like 300 years and now you're asking for your land back. Why did you ask it back at any point in the last 300 years? Why now? So it's bringing that up as well. 
uh, verse, let's see, verse 27. Wherefore, I have not sinned against thee, but thou doest me wrong to war against me. So he's saying that your justification for this war is what's wrong. We haven't done anything against you. You're coming up against us. You're the attacker. We're the defender. The Lord, ju the judge, be judged this day between the children of Israel and the children of Ammon. Howbeit the king of the children of Ammon hearkened not unto the words of Jephthah, which he sent them. Uh, he sent him. So they're like, stupid Israelite. We're not going to follow them. No, it's their fault. It's their fault. They, they're doubling down on the lie. They're telling themselves that it's the other person's fault. They're denying the facts. They're denying what's really there, basically. And sometimes this happens to us where we get an idea in our mind that we're not, we're so, we're so willing to defend a principle we've learned that we forget to look for truth. Okay. In looking for truth, it means we have to be willing to be vulnerable with our current ideas. Looking for truth requires that. In fact, even in the book of Alma, Alma chapter 32, the famous chapter on faith, he talks about having an openness to new ideas. That's part of the, the process that he goes through in Alma chapter 32, is having an openness to the idea. That's the symbol of planting the seed, okay? If you're not willing to accept a new idea, you throw the seed away. You won't even give it a, a chance. You have to plant it. You have to be open to let it grow. You let it see if it becomes something. This is an important point. It doesn't mean go out and accept everything that anybody says. But it says you have to be open to understanding what could be here in this other point of view. That is how you find truth. You do not find truth by sticking to the principle you have and never letting go. Sometimes the principle you have is a good one, but there's a better one that could replace it, a higher truth that could replace it. The children of Israel got certain truths, and then Jesus brought higher truths, and the Jews would not accept the higher truth. So this is not an uncommon pattern that we have of learning. What we have is good, but there's something better. And we have to be open to be willing to, we got to be that, have that vulnerability to accept something different to understand something better. And so this is a common thing that we see all the time with people is you get, you learn something and then you spend the rest of your life defending it. Even if it's wrong, you will defend it because it's something you learned. The thing is, is we need to take the time to understand, yes, I have learned something, but it doesn't mean I can't learn more new things and even change my current beliefs to be better. We have to be vulnerable and willing to do that if we want to learn truth. So what the Ammonites are doing is hardening their hearts. They're stiffening up and double down on the lie that they're telling themselves, their justification for what's going on, and not willing to look objectively at the other facts in history. That's the challenge that's happening here, basically. Verse 29, Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he passed over Gilead and Manasseh, and passed over Mizpah of Gilead, and from Mizpah uh, of Gilead, he passed over unto the children of Ammon. So he's, Jephthah's now moving. God is inspiring him to go out to Gilead, basically over to, uh, over to the Ammonites. Verse 30, And Jephthah vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, If thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon into mine hands, then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me, when I return in peace from the children of Ammon, shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. So he said, this is this is a kind of a crazy thing that he's doing here. He's saying, God, oh, we need to win this battle. We really need to do this. And I promise if you deliver them into our hands and you help us win this battle, that when I get home, the first thing that comes to the doors, I will offer as a burnt offering. Now, Here's the thing is he's probably, as, as we're going to see later on, he's probably thinking, because they used animals for burnt offerings, he's probably thinking the door opens up, animals are going to be coming out of the door. I'm going to, whatever animal comes out, I'm going to sacrifice one of my assets, my animals, as a burnt offering. So in reality, while it is something he is giving up, he's not giving up much in truth. He's giving up an animal to win an entire battle against his whole nation. So 
he's he's giving up something he might prize. He might have some favorite animals they keep they keep in the house, but he's willing to offer one of them, the first one through the door when he gets back, if they live and they win this war, basically. This is going to come back to test his faith, like it oftentimes does whenever we do these things. Uh, in fact, there's a story, uh, I wish I could remember the name of the member of the 70 that experienced this. I'll also tell that story after I get done here. So verse 32, so Jephthah uh, passed over unto the children of Ammon to fight against them. So this isn't just Jephthah himself going, the armies of Israel are coming with him. And the Lord delivered them into his hands, and he smote them from Arawar, even till thou come to Mineth, even twenty cities. So they just went from city to city to city and just kept winning. And unto the plain of the vineyards with a great, a very great slaughter. Thus the children of Ammon were subdued before the children of Israel. And Jephthah came to Mizpah unto his house. So they won. They defeated the children of Ammon. They beat him. They subdued him completely out. They won. Handedly won. Yes, a great victory. There's a lot of loss, but we won. So he's on his way home and he gets to where he can see his house and he's remembered this promise. Okay, whatever comes through that door, I promised to God for a burnt offering. Well, what comes through that door first? It says here, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and with dances. Do you think she was excited to see her daddy? She came out dancing and the little timbrels, little things on the fingers to, to clasp them together and things, uh, probably bells and things on to make merry, to dance, to perform music, uh, to celebrate her dad coming home, which totally sounds like something a teenage daughter or any daughter would do is to dance, make up her own music and dance to it, to be celebratory. Um, she was his only child. Beside her, he had neither son nor daughter. So this means he has to sacrifice his daughter. If he's going to keep his word, he has to sacrifice his daughter. Which means no generations for him. Jephthah's line will end because there's nobody else. They have to have more kids. Verse 35, and it came to pass when he saw her that he rent his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, thou hast brought me very low. He's probably praying to God at this point, And thou art one of them that trouble me. For I have opened my mouth unto the Lord and I cannot go back. So he realizes, I got to keep my promise. God kept his promise. I've got to do what he says. But this is my daughter. This is my daughter. So the justice says, I have to fulfill my oath. Mercy says, this is my daughter we're talking about. I can't sacrifice my daughter. Now, this is where we have to look at this and understand a little bit about this, okay? Because the rest of this is, uh, isn't is hundred percent clear, okay? There's a little bit of confusion in the rest of the story. So let me read this and then we'll talk about what happens, okay? Uh, so verse 36, she said unto him, My father, if thou hast opened thy mouth unto the Lord, do to me according to that which hath proceeded out of thy mouth. For as much as the Lord hath taken vengeance for thee of thine enemies, even of the children of Ammon. And she said unto her father, Let this thing be done for me. Okay, let me alone two months that I may go up and down upon the mountains and be well my virginity, and I and my fellows. Okay, so this is what's what's happened here. So remember, okay, he said, I will give whatever comes to the door as a burnt offering, which means I'm going to kill him. We spill the blood, we put it on the altar, then we burn the carcass. And he sees his daughter come through the door. Now we know from understanding the law of Moses that sacrifice of humans was banned. That was outlawed. Okay, the law of Moses teaches us that people are important and probably one of the most important things on the earth. We should value the life of a person. Very, very important point. This is iterated over and over again through uh, Moses' time. Value the life of a person. But yet he has to now sacrifice his daughter. So there's, I think, a lot more to this story 
than we know because technically he's supposed to offer her as a burnt sacrifice, not unlike Abraham and Isaac, which Abraham never did. He started going through those motions and at the last moment he was stopped. But there's no guarantee that's going to happen with Jephthah. And he has to offer his only daughter, only child, as a sacrifice. This is a really difficult thing to do. Could you imagine as a parent having to sacrifice your only child? This is hard. But we hear in here that what she says in verse 3, she says basically, well, whatever you told God to do, you should do, Dad. If that means it befalls on me to help to take this responsibility, then I will do it. I will I will honor what you've said with God. I will help with this. And in verse 37, she says, let me alone two months. Give me two months. I may go up and down the mountains. Be well my virginity. I and my fellows. So she's basically saying, let me spend two months alone up in the mountains and be well my virginity with my friends. Basically, we're going to go up and we're going to we're going to be sorrowful for my virginity. Now, it doesn't make sense that, so in, in some instance, we might look at this and think she's sad that she's a virgin and never had a man in her life and never got the chance to be a mother and do all those things because she's about to die. But she's not bewailing the fact that she's about to die. Wouldn't that mean more? And so there's actually some quotes here uh, out of a Bible commentary by Kyle and Dillich there's a couple of things that they've talked about in here and quoting a couple other people too. They say, Jephthah was compelled by his vow to dedicate his daughter to Jehovah in a lifelong, in a lifelong virginity. See, that's why I think this is, this is where this is going. The entreaty of the daughter that he would grant her two months time in order that she might lament her virginity upon the mountains with her friends would have been marvelously out of keeping with the account that she was to be put to death as a sacrifice. To mourn one's virginity does not mean to mourn because one has to die a virgin, but because one has to live and remain a virgin. But even if we were to assume that mourning her virginity was equivalent to mourning on account of her youth, it would be impossible to understand why this should take place upon the mountains. It would be altogether opposed to human nature that a child who has so soon to die should make use of a temporary respite to forsake her father altogether. It would no doubt be a reasonable thing that she should ask permission to enjoy life for two months longer before she was put to death, but that she should only think of bewailing her virginity when a sacrificial death was in prospect, which would rob her father of his only child, would be contrary to all the ordinary feelings of the human heart. Yet, inasmuch as the history lays special emphasis upon her bewailing her virginity, this must have stood in some peculiar relation to the nature of the vow. And this is confirmed by the expression to be well her virginity upon the mountains. If life had been in question, the same tears might have been shed at her at home. But her lamentations were devoted to her virginity, and such lamentations could not be uttered in the town and in the presence of men. Okay, that's remember, this is a, the law of Moses state. Women could not be well that around men. They had to go out and do that alone. Modesty required the solitude of the mountains for these. And so again, the still further clause in the account of the fulfillment of the vow, and she knew no man, is not in harmony with the assumption of a sacrificial death. This clause would add nothing to the description in that case. Since it was already known that she was a virgin, the words only gain their proper sense if we connect them with the previous clause. He did with her according to the vow which he had vowed, and understand them as describing what the daughter did in fulfillment of the vow. The father fulfilled his vow upon her, and she knew no man, i.e., he fulfilled the vow through the fact that she knew no man, but dedicated her life to the Lord as a spiritual burnt offering in a lifelong chastity. And the idea of a spiritual sacrifice is supported not only by the words, but also the most decisively, most decisively by the fact that the historian describes the fulfillment of the vow in the words he did to her according to his vow in such a manner as to lead to the conclusion that he regarded the act itself as laudable and good. But a prophetic historian could never have approved of a human sacrifice. So sacrifice, the human sacrifice idea, doesn't make sense in, in this. So I'm sure what was happening in here was Jephthah 
prayed and talked to God and said, okay, God, I told you, I promised you a burnt sacrifice, but it was my daughter and we can't do human sacrifices. That's against your laws. So I have to obey your, my oath to you, but, it, but literally obeying my oath to you means breaking your laws. So this isn't going to work. And so they, they probably went back and forth. And, and so God probably said, okay, I understand the predicament you're in. Law, justice is in a po opposition to its own justice. Basically, if I break my vow, I'm bad. If I break your law, I'm even worse. So we have to have a compromise in here. So this is where God's mercy can come in to make sure justice is fulfilled and everything gets balanced out. Okay, justice alone can't handle this. We have to have mercy in here. This is that, that duality that uh, I had mentioned. Uh, this is something that's important because what happens? He says, I'll tell you what, dedicate your daughter to me, which means she cannot marry and have children ever. So Jephthah still loses his line, his lineage, basically, at least through his, his only daughter. But she lives. So she gets to live, which means he doesn't break the law of Moses. And he still gets to fulfill this because in a spiritual sense, she is an offering to God, basically. So this is what they, he came to her probably later and said, I talked with God. We got it worked out. I'm not going to have to kill you is the good part of this. The bad part is you basically have to remain a virgin the rest of your life. You'll live with mom and I, you'll be in our family, but you won't know a man, you won't have a family, you won't go off to be with another family. You'll be single the rest of your life, basically. And so this is where the verse 37 comes in and she says, let this thing be done for me. Let me alone two months. I might go up and down the mountains, be well my virginity. I and my fellows. So she takes a bunch of her friends, goes up to the mountains and bewails her virginity. Now, if you think about it, if she was being sacrificed as a sacrifice, she could be like, all right, let me go up to the mountains to, to cry about this and bemoan it and then just leave and, and just flee the area and never come back. Uh, but she doesn't. So, and because it's focused on her virginity, I really believe that that's the part of the story we haven't been told that's in between 36 and 37 that Jephthah talked with God and they figured out justice still has to be met, but there is room for mercy in here to make sure that everything is taken care of appropriately. So always remember that justice and mercy have to play a part. Very, very important. So verse 38, and he said, go. And he sent her away for two months and she went with her companions and bewailed her virginity upon the mountains. And it came to pass at the end of two months that she returned unto her father who did with her according to his vow, which he had vowed, and she knew no man. So that was the vow. She cannot know a man. She cannot have sex, basically. And it was a custom in Israel. So this became a thing in Israel, basically. And this is the custom that the daughters of Israel went yearly to lament the daughter of Jephthah the Gileadite four days in a year. So this became a tradition that... Four day, for four days, once a year, there's a four-day holiday where the daughters of Israel would go up in the mountains and lament the virginity of Jephthah's daughter as a remembrance of this. So this is fascinating stories of the dynamic of justice and mercy and this duality that we have sometimes. Justice can rarely be perfectly applied without having mercy. If you do absolute justice, it goes bad. Okay, if you do absolute mercy, it goes bad. But you have to combine them to get them to balance that yin and yang, basically. Okay, they balance each other out. So this is a great example of this balance that we see uh, and helping out and realizing too, if you make a promise to God, you better keep it and be careful what you promise because he will keep his end of the bargain and you'll have to keep yours. Otherwise you could be in trouble. So just remember that. So be really careful when you make a promise with God like that, basically. Uh, so thanks for watching. I hope you're enjoying these videos. Love to hear thoughts in the comments, like the videos, share them with other people. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in the next chapter for more of this fun story.